Here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is where we're going to be at today. And then after we're done there, we're going to hop over to Revelations chapter 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Revelation chapter 20. So, I probably told this story before. I'm going to tell it again. That's what I do. My boss says I keep on... When we go to parties and stuff, I tell the same jokes and the same stories over and over again. But I love those stories, and I love those jokes. So here we go. So as many of you know, I absolutely love and adored my uh, grandpa, my grandpa Huff. Uh, and in our relationship, and, and, and with my relationship with most people, the, the meaner I am to you, the more I like you. Right? So I love my grandpa. Grandpa had this big old belly. And it was like a drum. It was tight. It wasn't this big floppy belly. It was like tight like a drum, right? I mean, you could just throw a quarter out off of it and bounce across the room. Grandpa also had this nasty spit tune he carried everywhere with him. I don't even think it was designed to be a spit tune, but he used it. For those of the kids that don't know, a spit tune is, I just realized this, uh, whatever some folks chew tobacco, don't do it. When some people kids chew tobacco, one time they chew tobacco, they need to spit that out. So they spit it. And a spit tune. They carry this thing around with them all the time. Okay? Well, it was really nasty. Grandpa also had a habit of falling asleep anywhere he was at. In church, watching TV, at ball games. It didn't matter where Grandpa was at, wherever he was at. If he was sitting down, he was going to fall asleep. And one of my favorite things to do in life was whenever I found Grandpa asleep, go over to his tight belly and just poke him right in the belly. And he'd always just jump. I didn't care if he was about his heart condition. I didn't care. I was so, you know, I was so bad. But he would, oh, just every time jump like that and get scared. And I loved it. It was so much fun. What I wouldn't do to poke him in the belly anymore. So there it was. I forget what holiday it was. Uh, but I remember he was, for some reason, not in his recliner. He was sitting on one end of the couch like this. Spit tune in hand, girl. This two there, and fell asleep like this on the couch at my grandmother's house. My aunt was sitting on this end of the couch. You know, we were all talking, Thanksgiving, Christmas, I don't know. Good time for being had by all. Grandpa's having a great time too. He went to sleep, that's what he did. So there he was sleeping. So I'm like, here's another opportunity for Josh. So I go up to Grandpa and go, boom, right in the belly. And you know what he does? What he always does. Like that, and he took that spit tune and tossed it down the couch, and it, and, and it didn't seal. It wasn't a spit tune. I don't even know what it was. Like a sippy cup or something. I don't know. It was blue and nasty. Anyhow, uh, it is. It's like I can see it in slow motion. Too, 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 and it opens up. And all that nasty tobacco spit. It's going all over Grandma's couch, all over her nice little throw she kept on it. And then it went all the way down and all over my aunt. I was like, so this is the day that I die. <laughs> this is the day that my grandmother chooses to kill me. So I just, I look at her and what's grandma do? Jesse! Will you send me something with that in your hand? And she just tears into grandpa. Oh, that's all thing. I told you not to stick with that in hand. That thing's nasty. You don't even sell up right in this laid into it. I just look at Grandpa, and Grandpa looks at me like, you know, like this is on you. And I'm just waiting for my turn to get, you know, in trouble by somebody. And of course, what I did was I said, hey, listen, it's not Grandpa's fault. It's my fault. I should have done that to him. Please forgive me. I didn't do that. It's a lie. I was like, I was like Grandma's chewing that Grandpa. I'm like, I'm going to get a sack in the kitchen. That's what I'm doing. I did not get in any trouble. If anything, people thought it was hilarious that I did it. And my Grandpa took all the wrath of my Grandma over that entire situation. I, I share that story because I got off Scott clean. I, I was a lot to blame there, wasn't I? My grandpa's just trying to take a nap with his pit tune in your hand. You could say maybe he shouldn't have been doing that. Grandma told him that. But I had a lot of blame there. And I got off scot clean. Like scot free. Like no, I, nothing. I went and got myself a snack. And all my cousins laughed and thought I was a hero for the day. That's what I just did. Except for my aunt, she didn't think I was funny at all. <laughs> but still, she, I mean, nobody's doing the job. Sometimes we, we, we do things. And we deserve punishment 
but we don't get it, right? And sometimes that's because nobody knew about it. Other times it's because there's lots of different reasons, right? Well, when I think of that story, when I think of that instance, I think about the gospel. Because there's a lot of things that Josh has done in my life that I deserve punishment for. There's a lot of sin in my life that I deserve punishment for. And there's a penalty to be paid for that sin. There's a penalty to be paid for, for what I've done wrong. I've sinned against people. I've sinned against a good and holy God. I wasn't naive about it. I knew what I was doing. And yet that penalty was not paid by me. It's been paid by Christ. So I want to read this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This starts out, we're starting verse 4. This starts out on a really great note. We're going to do a lot of reading today, guys. Now, for we know when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body, made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing, for we put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. So he's talking about when we die. He's talking about when we die. He's talking about when we die, we won't just be spirits floating around. We'll have bodies and we'll be restored. We'll be, he's calling them heavenly bodies. I mean, by the way, do you, do you realize that? Like, you're not going to be a ghost when you die. You're like just this, this spirit passing through walls that says we'll have heavenly bodies. We'll, You'll, you'll have a body, a restored body. Another sermon for another day. Just want to touch on that. While we live in these earthly bodies, we grow inside. It's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies to call this. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this. And as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. We are not at home with the Lord. We are not at home with the Lord. Where is home? You ever gone away from for a long time and come home? It's just comfortable. I know whenever I'm going on these mission trips, I don't sleep as well as when I finally come home and sleep in my own bed. There's something about home, isn't there? Even when my wife and I, we lived in West, uh, West Kentucky, the Paducah region, for, for about five years of our lives. We have many friends down there, many folks we genuinely love and consider them family. But it's not home. When we were there, we knew it wasn't home. As soon as we got back, we're like, yeah, we're home. It's just Perry County. Who cares about that? I don't, I don't know if it's home. Well, what he's teaching us here is that our home is with the Lord in heaven. The Bible actually calls us aliens. We're foreigners here. This isn't home. Home is with God. That's our home. That's where we will reside. That's where, in the scheme of things, in the scheme of eternity, that's home. In heaven with our Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident. And we would rather be away from these earthly bodies. For then we will be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body. Our goal is to please Him. So we've just talked about a lot of wonderful things, that we have a, a home in heaven with our Lord who, who loves us, and things will be restored, and while we go through strife here, and, and groan, and struggles are here, and heaven will be with God, we'll be with Christ, we'll be in new bodies, heavenly bodies. This is a great message, right? Like I'm, I'm stoked about this. This gives me hope, this gives me warm fuzzies. And then we get to verse 10. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. I want to read it exactly right. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. We will receive what we deserve as we stand before Christ himself. It's a sobering thought to me. One day, after I go down to 
somebody wheels me down to Tommy, who well, Tommy will probably be going to, whatever they will wheel me down to Hoover Funeral Home or some funeral, some funeral home. They scatter my ashes somewhere in Perry County or whatever they decide to do to Joshua. I will stand before Christ for judgment. And I will get what's coming to me for whatever what I deserve for the good and for the evil I do. So a lot of people hear this and they say, man, we better do a lot more good than evil. Because that's, I mean, that's what we're going to be judged on. Right? That's what we're going to be judged on. Either they're going to look at the good we've done and the evil what we've done, and which adds up most. I have no hope of that. If, if that's what that verse is telling us, I have no hope. Because I have sinned beyond imagination. I, the, I believe in a doctor called total depravity. I am totally depraved. I have sinned, everybody listen to me, I have sinned against a good and holy God. And you have too. And there's no good that we can do to make up for that. There's no good that we can do. He's going to look at, at me and if I, if I show up, hey Josh, this is your judgment. What do you have to say for yourself? And I say, hey look at all this good stuff I've done. I'm a pastor. I've gone on mission trips. I've given to the church. I've sacrificed to the church for your bride. Look at all the stuff I've done. Josh, as you know, for all of sin and falling short of the glory of God. So all this stuff right here is, you sin against me. You think this is going to make up for it? So I'm seeing more pride in your life, Josh. You think this makes up for all the evil you've done. You chose to sin. You chose to turn away from me. Even in your good motives sometimes. Even the good things you've done. Sometimes you had poor motives. For all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. I have no hope in that. And exactly so if that's what this verse is, 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 is teaching. It's teaching that I will be condemned. Let's skip on ahead to, to, to verse 14. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all. We also believe that we have all died to our own life. He died for everyone, so that those who receive his new life will no, will no longer live for themselves. Those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life is gone, has begun. And all of this is a gift of God, from God, who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not, no longer counting people's sins against them. Let's read that verse again, because it gives me a lot of hope. For God was in Christ reconciling the world. I'm going to add Josh in there, forgive me. Reconciling Josh to himself. Put your own name in there. No longer counting Josh's sins against him. And he gave him this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ. So when we say, come back to God, just as we sang this morning, come home, come home. Come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned. Christ never sinned. I did. Christ never did. To be the offering for our sin. I like another uh, translation of the scripture. It says he became our sin. So that we could be made right with God through Christ. So that we could be made right through God. With God through Christ. He was without sin. It says he reconciles us to God. Sometimes I think I've failed you as a pastor, as a preacher. I lead with love. I, I, I think Jesus teaches us to lead, lead with love, doesn't he? When people surrounded that, 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 that girl who was in the middle of adultery, they just caught her. And they said, the law says to stone her. What are you going to say, Jesus? He led with love. He said, whoever's without sin, cast the first stone. And they all ran out of there. And there he is with this girl who's broken. She's just been caught. She's been humiliated. 
And so you're picking her up. And he says, go and sin no more. He told her to sin no more. He called her to truth and repentance. He led with love, though. He stood up for her when other people were ready to tear her down. So I leave the floor. But it's not very loving to not tell people the truth and the fullness of the gospel. And there will be a judgment day. And we'll stand before Christ. What do we have to say for ourselves? What do we, what do we have to say for ourselves? What, what will I have to say for myself? When we go to the book of Revelation, we'll be in Revelation chapter 20. 11 through 15. Let's hear we're talking about the final judgment. And some people uh, re refer to this piece of scripture as the, the great white throne room. And there's a judgment that's taking place here. And John is writing this and he has a vision and he's telling us this vision. He says, and I saw a great white throne and one sitting on it. This is verse 11. I don't know if I said that. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. You can't hide from this God. You can't hide from this judgment. You can, you can cower if you want, but you can't hide from it. It will find you. You can't run from it. We can live our whole lives on earth thinking that we're running from a judgment, thinking we're running from God, thinking that he doesn't see us, thinking that I'll do my thing, I'll deal with that some other day, but he sees us, and he sees us now. And this judgment... People will know that he is present. And there's nowhere to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were open. There's books being open. Books apparently are important. He's bringing them up. Including the book of life. And the dead, so there's multiple books here, and one of them is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The dead were judged by according to what they had done as was written in the books. So if, if that's my plea, God, look at what I've done. Look at my book. Here's all the good stuff I've done. And he doesn't say, yeah, but there, you know, this book also contains all this bad stuff you've done. This that you've said. So if that's my plea, what happens? Let's find out. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. We could be a prideful people. I think we'll be humbled very quickly on the judgment day. If our case at this judgment is, look at all the good I've done. Look at my membership. I was a member of Branchville Methodist Church. I was a pastor. I went on mission trips. I was baptized. I took communion. I gave to good things. I was a good person. He tells us if we bring that case, if we have our book of deeds, he says what's happened. There's a lake of fire that we've cast into. <clears throat> now, what does that look like? What is that? It's another sermon for another day, but it doesn't sound pleasant. But he keeps on talking about this book of life. And I want to talk about that this morning. There's a book of life. And all that stuff we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 about, about an eternity with, eternity with God and what and our new heavenly bodies, and, and being at home with the Lord, when he's speaking to those whose name is written in the book of life. So how do we get our names in the book of life? Is that, that, that's, that's where I want my name to be. The, it's interesting, uh, in another script, piece of scripture in the, in the Bible, it refers to Jesus as Wonderful Counselor. 
Now, a lot of times when we think of a counselor, we think of a marriage counselor or somebody that, that, that helps us through our problems or whatnot, but that's not, not an accurate translation, uh, not a very accurate translation. A better translation would be an attorney, a lawyer. Because this judgment, if I stand before myself, a lot of times if you go to court, sometimes you can go to court and represent yourself. But you not not be very well versed in the law. A lot of times it's advised that you have an attorney there for you. Somebody to represent you. And the Bible says Jesus is the wonderful attorney, the wonderful counselor. And he could be your attorney and your counselor. But Josh, I thought you said he was the judge. Absolutely. Wouldn't you love the judge to be your attorney? Wouldn't you love that? The Bible says that, that he's reconciled us to him through the death of Jesus. The judge himself paid our penalty, paid our price. The Bible teaches us that Jesus, first of all, it teaches us that we are sinners. And most of us understand that. Maybe you don't. I don't know. But it teaches us that we are sinners, and that separates us from God. It then teaches us that, that we needed to pay a penalty. For our sin, it needed to be paid. And we can't pay it. Right. Look at this book over here. Yeah, this book's going to get you in trouble. These deeds aren't, they don't amount to nothing. You still sin. You're guilty. But Jesus himself took our penalty on the cross. He died on the cross. And all the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus on the cross. All the wrath that Josh deserved came down on Jesus. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 there, we just read, it says that he became our sin. And he took all that penalty for us. And we can get our name written in the book of life if we put our faith in Christ. If we repent. Well, repent is it's a military term. It means it pretty much means an about face. We're going this way. This ain't looking good. Boys, repent. All right, now we're going this way. It means that we stop living our lives for ourselves. It's not about Josh's goal, Josh's aspirations, Josh's uh, the things he wants in life. But I give my life to Christ, and it's about what he wants. We surrender him, and we trust in him. We recognize that we're, we're sinners, but we also recognize that God loves us so much that he was crucified for us and died in our place for us and is given freely to us. And if we accept that and we put our faith in Christ, he writes our name in the book of life. And he loves us. He loves us. Do you know what I'm fearful for, for the American church? I'm fearful that the American church, the people of the American, of the, of the churches in America, many of them think they have, they've sprinkled Jesus over their lives. They've got a little religious. They're morally good. They go to church every Sunday. But their not, name's not written in the book of life. They still haven't put their faith in Christ. But what they've committed to Christ is a Sunday once in a while, an offering once in a while, being good once in a while, or a lot. They've never said that Christ here is my life. I, I give it. I repent. I give my life to you for my faith in you. The Bible says that in the last days, that many people are going to be surprised. They're, you know, when they meet Jesus, they'll be surprised, it says. They'll say, but, but hey, we did all these wonderful things to you. He said, I never knew you. I never knew you. We sang this morning, uh, Alan Jackson sang, we sang along with him, Come home. Come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Come to Christ. Turn to Christ. Sometimes we think of God as this, this angry guy singing in the clouds, ready for you to screw up. Ready for you to mess up. Ready for you to sin. As soon as you do, I'm going to hammer you. And you better pay. You better try to do more better things. You better try to be a good person or I'm going to get you. I know what you've done. I'm mad at you. I'm angry with you. And God is angry at our sin. God's not happy with our sin. But, but that... It, it, this morning, I went to pick up my dogs. Okay? I love those dogs. They're, they're, they're pound puppies. Um, and we brought them into our home. They have big hearts. They're, 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 they're big dudes. They, they, they tear up everything. Okay? Like, they chew on our house. I don't know why we love these dogs. They, they literally chew on our brick mode. Currently, for some reason, red, 
keeps on tearing the, uh, the, the trim or, or off of our exterior outlets and chewing it up and I put it back on, telling me it's bad, and it lasts for five minutes and then I find out you already going, why? But I still love these dogs. And they ran off yesterday. What idiots! They are fed here. They're taken care of here. They got little kids that love them and pet on them all the time. And they ran off. That is so unlike you and me, right? Right? We wouldn't, if somebody loved us like God, if somebody cared for us like God, if he gave promises to us like God, we would stay with him. We would not sin against him, would we? But we do. So what did I do when they ran off yesterday? Good riddance. I'm going to get me a new piece of trim. Won't ever have dogs chewing up again. I can save all the money I spend on shot collars. Shot collars are like $144 and they tear them up and eat them. <laughs> right? All the food, the vet shots. I'm going to save so much more money. We can let the chickens out again. We really can't let no chickens out to roam in the yard and eat the chicks now. Dogs eat them. I was so happy, wasn't I? Thank God they're gone. Hallelujah. No. I was driving all over God's green earth. It was cold last night. The window was down. Reggie! Red, going down French, French Ridge Road. Going down Locust Road. Coming up Lakewood. Going to Gatchel. Which is where they ended up at. Didn't see them. Didn't care to come to that. I knew they hurt me a lot of times. Chief Red, don't let it come. And when I saw them this morning, what did I do? You stupid dog. I beat them. I should leave you here. I'm going to take you over. I'm going to, I'm going to beat you, right? It's not what I did. Chief was smart enough to know that's what he deserved. Red had no idea. He didn't know he deserved that. He's like, hey, 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 I'm kind of hungry. Can we go home? I see you brought the truck. Chief, Chief's like, oh, man. Oh, man. This ain't good. Dad's here. I'm hot. I'm hot when Dad's here. So I'm like, oh, man. Put on a show. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't beat him. I was so happy to see him. I didn't sleep well last night. I went over there and I picked him up. I put him in the truck. And I brought him. I'll post a picture on Facebook later today. As soon as I got them home, they, they, went, they, all went, they went to sleep because they've been up all night long. And when I found them in their, in their uh, red, which is dog house during the day, which he never does. And when I went to feed him before I came here this morning, one of the kids had wrapped him up in a little blue blanket, which they're not supposed to take outside. They love that dog. So they wrapped him up like a baby. He's just there sleeping. He's home now. He's safe. He's taken care of again. We just wanted him to come home. And they're going to tear up our house again next week. We love them anyhow. And that's how I feel about a dog. A dog. I'm a dog person, but I know he's just a dog. I know he's not a human being. They don't have the value that humans have, right? Do you recognize how much God loves you? Do you recognize how much he wants you to come home? Do you recognize all this is motivated from his, his, his glory? From his love for you. He didn't have to die on a cross for you. He, Jesus and the Father are actually talking about that if you notice in the scriptures. Father, let this, let this cup pass for me. If there's any other way, Father. If there's any other way, let's do that way. Because I'm about to be crucified for the Romans. I know, that's torturous. I don't want, if there's any other way, let's do it that way. But not by my will, but your will. If, if this is what it takes to go get Josh, if this is what it takes, Go get Gator. This is what it takes to get Matt. This is what it takes. Let's do this. Ride or die. And it's going to be die. Let's do this. And he loves you that much. And all he, all he asks you to do is to put your faith in him. And to say, give me your life. How's your life? How's your way working for you? Do you have hope in that? How's that working for you? Are you wore out? Are you tired? Of doing your thing the way you want to do it? We all recognize that one day this is going to be all over, right? Like, like our life here will be over. Then what? The whole eternity exists out after that. But not a whole eternity exists after that. But not just for that life, but for this life. Like, I don't need you. You, I don't just need Jesus in the next life, the life to come after we die here on earth. We need him now. We need him now. When he says, I've come to give you life, just, just give me your life. Just trust me. Just come home. I got the truck. I'm going to pick you up and put you in the truck. Let's go home. That doesn't mean you're not going to sin. That's not going to be, mean that you're not perfect. 
It means that you've made a decision, though, in your life that you're going to follow Christ. You give him your life. You accept what he's done for you in the cross. You recognize that he was only died on that cross, but he rose from the dead. So if he rose from the dead, then he can redeem us too. We can live again. My question for you this morning, have you made that decision? Have you actually made that decision in your life? When you stand before Christ on the judgment day, what's going to be your answer? Why shall I let you through these gates? I'm going to use that terminology. Why? What makes you think you've reconciled with me? I'm going to stand before him. I'm not going to talk about a dang thing I've done because I don't want to bury myself. Christ, I can only plead. I can only plead your blood. And that's the last thing I'm going to say. I now turn this over to my attorney. He will speak on my behalf. And that would be you, Father. That would be you, Christ. You are my wonderful counselor. And I need you right now. Speak on my behalf. And he'll, I think he'll say something along the lines of, it looks here that uh, all these sins have been wiped away. They've been paid for. And there were sins. Now they've been atoned for. They've been forgiven because they were paid for on the cross by my death. And due to my resurrection, Joshua now has life. Have you made that decision to follow God? I didn't ask you if you made a decision to be religious. I didn't ask you if you made a decision to be a better person. I didn't ask you if you made a decision to be baptized or to take communion or be a member of a church. Have you made the decision to give your life to Christ? Have you made that decision? Here's what I'm going to leave you with this morning. That question, and then an encouragement to do this. You may be sitting there thinking, I don't know if I've made that decision. I need to talk about that more. Holler at me. Give me a call. Give it, shoot me an email. Shoot me a Facebook message. We'll go get tacos. We'll do something. We'll get coffee. We'll do whatever you want. We'll go for a walk. Talk to me. I'm going to be leaving for, for Henderson Settlement immediately after the service today. But if you're not sure about where you stand with God, I, I, I can wait. You know, we're going to stop off at Culver's on the way there. The Culver's will still be open when I get there if I need to talk to you before I leave. So grab it. Know that you are loved. And know that, that God is calling you home. He's not calling you to the jail as an angry judge wanting to, 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 to beat you, wanting to put you in your place, wanting to make you pay the penalties. He's calling you as a father. As a father calls us home. He's calling you home like that. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your gospel. We thank you for the hope that we have in you. We thank you for doing all the work. Because we were just going to make a bigger mess of this than we've already made. And just like a lot loving father did, when you saw that you needed to step in, when you saw you needed to come in and provide the solution, when you saw that we needed you, you came and provided the solution. And all you call us to, you, you give us this gift and say, come home. Put your faith in me. Come home. Get in the truck. We're going home. Help us to understand that. Help us to wrap our minds around that. Show us what repentance means. Lift veils. Sometimes people hear this message, Father, there's a veil over their eyes. Your word says that, that, that Satan himself has put a veil over their eyes. and why they, It's like these words just bounce out of their ears. They don't make sense of it. They don't hear it. So rip those veils off this morning. And speak to people. Penetrate our hearts. I pray that if anybody here doesn't know you as the Lord and Savior, and I'm sure there are several here who don't know you as the Lord and Savior, I pray they'd reach out to me or to another spiritual advisor a spirit who understands the gospel, who can teach the gospel, and they put their faith in you. Father God, we love you, and we thank you for all that you have blessed us with. Thank you for bringing us home. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Guys, God bless. Have a great Sunday. Be praying for us as we go down to Appalachia.